This is uh, Microbiology Lecture 12. I'm going to talk about antimicrobial drugs. Now, uh, quite often the first slide has definitions because there are terms that you should be familiar with, comfortable with. Um, in terms of antimicrobial drugs, you know, it's a type of chemotherapy. Uh, the term chemotherapy is somehow has gotten into the minds of the public as uh, referring only to drugs that are used for cancer treatment. Um, but the truth of the matter is that any drug used to treat a disease or pathological process is you know, that the use of it is a chemotherapeutic approach. It's a chemotherapy. Antimicrobial drugs will interfere with growth of microbes in a host. And that's an important idea because, you know, you're putting them into a human, a person. They're put into the person in order to kill the bacteria, but not harm the person. That's a, always, and that's true for every drug, it has to really be targeted towards processes that are characteristic of the microorganism and have nothing to do with the host and won't interfere with the host. Uh, now, there are a lot of different antimicrobial drugs and we'll talk about major different types, uh, different classes. A lot will discuss antibiotics and something that uh, I would say very few who don't study it know this, but truth be told that antibiotics are in fact produced by microorganisms. They are uh, compounds that other microorganisms use to compete against that some some microorganisms use to compete against others because they're all they're all in there together and they need to have some sort of advantage over the others so they need to inhibit the growth of other types of microorganisms and what micro microbes have 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 developed and that includes uh, bacteria and fungi uh, what they've developed are uh, the ability to produce substances that can inhibit different other species of microbes that would otherwise compete with them so it gives them a it gives them an advantage now when you produce those in high enough quantities, if they're used in high enough quantities uh, in a person, uh, if they're purified from the bacteria or they're, if they're synthesized, made um, artificially in the lab, then they can be quite effective. And what you're always looking for is selective toxicity, something that will kill microorganisms without injuring the host, the human. And typically, it's going to be targeting a specific function that's characteristic only of microorganisms, targeting the mic uh, a function of the microorganism that you're trying to kill off, <clears throat> and something that is not part of the normal physiology of the of the human host. It hasn't, although it may seem ancient to you, it actually has not been that long since uh, the discovery of antimicrobial drugs, specifically uh, antibiotics. They were actually discovered in the 20s. They didn't come into common use until uh, the late 40s, early 50s, but <clears throat> and more and more of them were discovered from that point forward. But they were discovered in the late 20s. Uh, Alex, they were probably observed many, the effect of antibiotics were probably observed many times, but people couldn't interpret it. 
most of many discoveries, many very fundamental discoveries in science and medicine are, you know, observed but not understood, and only with more and more information or the right person seeing them uh, do does do they uh, become uh, revealed. So what a Alexander Fleming, in fact, found was that he was culturing a, a bacterial culture of Staphylococcus aureus on a nutrient agar plate, and he had gotten, and it's quite common, I can tell you, to get uh, contamination with um, some other organism in your culture, and it's just in the environment. And one of the types of organisms that often uh, contaminate uh, cultures are um, fungi, because the spores are floating around in the air. In fact, in the spring, quite often when it's more, it's more wet and getting warm, often it's a bigger problem in the spring. And you, you get uh, contamination with fungi as opposed to other types of bacteria. Well, what happened was he uh, had a uh, contamination of his culture with uh, an organism, a fungal organism called penicillium, which is a fungus. In fact, it's the fungus that grows on bread when you leave bread for too long, particularly if it's a little bit moist and you get that blue fuzzy look on it. That's a fungus, that's penicillium. And he got that kind of uh, spore in his culture. And he noticed that the, as you can see here in this uh, diagram, in this, photo, in this photo, he noticed that the bacteria were growing okay down here, but in the area near the fungal colony, all this area in here, they were inhibited. You see that they're much smaller so they were seriously inhibited. So he understood, in fact, he had the insight to understand and realize that there was something, particularly because of the shape of the inhibition, you see that kind of round uh, arc around the colony, he realized that there was something being produced by the penicillium colony and def that was diffusing out into the agar and inhibiting the growth of Staphylococcus aureus. And he managed to identify it uh, and purify it and uh, it started to get use. Um, the first clinical trials were in 1940. During the Second World War, I don't think they, they had much access to it, but certainly after that they did. Up until, in fact, the, the 40s, before the discovery of antibiotics, uh, hospitals uh, really uh, there was tremendous uh, infection and progression of infection and they stunk of, you know, uh, infected tissue. The, if you think hospitals are bad now, they were much, 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 much worse back then in terms of the, the, the smells. Okay, so microorganisms are the source, really, of antibiotics. Now, <clears throat> as they're identified, often these compounds and purified compounds, the structure of the compounds are, you know, clearly understood, then many of them are um, able to be produced synthetically in uh, chemical, through chemical synthetic uh, techniques. Not all, by the way, and we'll talk about that but here are some representative uh, examples. Uh, you certainly don't have to m memorize this table, but you can see that many of the uh, antibiotics that you're familiar with, you've heard, you know, you've heard of neomycin, I believe, streptomycin, gentamicin, erythromycin, uh, tetracycline, um, maybe some of the penicillin, maybe some of the others also, but they're all produced by microorganisms. These are two different major groupings of, uh, and there are some representative uh, uh, organisms in those groupings. These are different types of um, um, <clears throat> bacteria, and these are different types of uh, fungi here. 
So, uh, you know, these, uh, these uh, ge genera, genera is the plural of genus. These genera are well-known uh, producers of uh, antibiotics. There are many out there that are still waiting to be discovered. And uh, companies put huge effort into finding uh, different organisms. Most bacteria, as I've told you, most microorganisms, many fungi probably, and certainly thousands of, of uh, bacteria have, never, have not yet been identified or characterized, purified in culture and found out how they compete with other organisms. So there's certainly a lot of promise still out there. <clears throat> now, there's a certain spectrum of activity that different antibiotics have. You know, if you look at the different organisms, if these are prokaryotes and these are eukaryotic organisms, you know, these some of these do produce antibiotics. Uh, the prokaryotic organisms, you can divide them up into the gram-negative bacteria and the gram-positive bacteria. And then, of course, there's also the mycobacteria. These are uh, put in a separate group, mainly because they are, grow um, intracellularly. They'll infect the host cell and grow inside the cell. Um, but their sensitivity to uh, antibiotics, the acti the, the, there's, there's sensitivity to the to um, inhibition of their growth by antibiotics uh, varies. You can see that penicillin, in fact, is uh, most active against gram-positive bacteria. And I mentioned this quite early on in the, in the course, in, probably back in August or September, in that uh, penicillin is an inhibitor of uh, peptidoglycan synthesis. And gram-positive bacteria have a thick peptidoglycan layer in their cell wall. So the effect of penicillin by inhibiting that peptidoglycan synthesis, it inhibits the um, a, a large portion of the cell wall structure and that weakens it and they, they lyse. It has less of effect and is, is less uh, effective against gram negatives because peptidoglycan is a much smaller component of the cell wall. It doesn't weaken the cell wall enough. Um, <clears throat> streptomycin has a broader specificity. It, however, is uh, active against uh, gram negative organisms and also mycobacteria. Tetracycline is active against not only gram negative and gram positive, but also uh, bacteria that can grow intracellularly or that do grow intracellularly. You can see that uh, these are obligate intracellular bacteria. They have to grow inside the cell. Uh, so tetracycline is what is called a broad spectrum antibiotic because of its wider range of activity against a wide, it's because of its uh, broad range of activity against a, a, a wider variety of microorganisms. So in terms of gram negative and gram positive, which are important groupings, Penicillin is most active against gram-positive, streptomycin against gram-negative, and tetracycline against both, for which reason it's called a broad-spectrum uh, antibiotic. There are uh, <clears throat> uh, clearly different uh, antibiotics uh, active against different groupings of organisms. The broad spectrum ones, as I said, affect a wider range, uh, like gram negative and gram positive, uh, the effect of tetracycline against gram negative and gram positive. If, an or, if, a, a, uh, if a drug is, a bacteri is bactericidal, that means it directly kills the organism, the bacterial organism. If it's bacteriostatic, that means it 
prevents the growth. In other words, the multiplication of the organism, which uh, sometimes can be uh, uh, quite helpful if there's no good bactericidal agent, then they'll try bacteriostatic agents. Now, antibiotic therapy does have its problems. And uh, one of those is super infection. You know, when you have a whole bunch of uh, microorganisms growing in a person, the normal ones, the ones that are normally present and, and, and that kind of normal mic, uh, microflora or um, microbiota is, uh, is actually quite important because it prevents the, it competes with and can prevents the growth of organisms that, that may have a pathogenic effect. Um, <clears throat> so, um, the problem is that, uh, the problem is that with, uh, antibiotic therapy, sometimes you kill off all the normal microorganisms. And so, um, some pathogenic, potentially pathogenic ones, can grow into larger quantities. They can overgrow, and you get what is called a superinfection. And this is uh, being seen with uh, uh, Clostridium difficile, because uh, often uh, Clostridium difficile infections occur in people who are on uh, heavy antibiotic uh, therapy which kills off all the other microorganisms. You know, when you take an antibiotic, it's not only in, into you, you're not only killing the organism that's causing that infection in your arm, but also all the similar organisms that are in your gut, normal ones too. So you can get an overgrowth of something that's resistant to the, to the, um, to the antibiotic, like C. difficile might be. You know, something that normally is kept in check because of the presence of all those other organisms competing for space and uh, resources, food resources. Sometimes when you take antibiotics, you have, uh, because you have an infection, what happens is you kill off 99.99% of the organisms, but the few who have the gene that codes for some sort of resistance uh, mechanism, there might be a very small number in there, but now you've killed off the others. So those are the ones that grow out and they're resistant. They keep growing. They'll grow actively and uh, you've killed off other or uh, the other ones. So now you have a person who's not only you know, seemed to have been getting better and was getting better, but now you have a big problem because they still have the infection, but now all the bugs are, all the organisms are resistant to the particular antibiotic. So they always have to, they'll, they'll, have, they'll have to switch, they have to switch uh, which antibiotic they're using. So that's one problem, super infection. Well, <clears throat> when you look at antimicrobial drugs, when you look at, uh, you know, different antibiotics, uh, they have a, they target mechanisms that are specific to the bacteria and are not found typically in the uh, eukaryotic host cells. So that they have a preferential effect on the bacteria. And the kinds of things that are targeted are cell wall synthesis or uh, protein synthesis, the type of protein synthesis that mechanisms of protein synthesis that are peculiar, specific to bacteria, inhibition of nucleic acid replication and transcription, um, injury to the plasma membrane or inhibition of some sort of essential metabolite. Uh, and that tip often, uh, that's because it targets, the drug targets a, a particular enzyme only found in the 
in bacteria. So it, the bacteria can't, uh, you know, a particular uh, pathway involving several enzymes, you know, substrate enzyme product, which now is the substrate for the next enzyme, a particular pathway, an enzymatic pathway in bacteria, if you inhibit one enzyme, then that pathway won't be active and the final product can't be produced. So inhibition of cell wall synthesis, inhibition of, uh, it's called inhibition of synthesis of central metabolites, and it's because of inhibition of uh, particular enzyme, inhibition of protein synthesis or inhibition of nucleic acid replication transcription. All these are targeted mechanisms, mechanisms targeted by particular antibiotic drugs. And there are examples here shown. And the only one that I'm, that I have explained or would explain it, how it, what it inhibits is penicillin that it inhibits cell wall synthesis because it targets peptidoglycan synthesis and therefore it targets cell wall synthesis in gram positive organisms. The others, yes, these are antibiotics that you've heard of, but I'm not going to ask you which mechanism they target. Okay, we're going to go through each of these and so that you understand in general uh, about how they work. Uh, you don't have to memorize the specifics necessarily at all, but in general. So inhibition of cell wall synthesis, uh, as I told you, peptidoglycan uh, is, is present in the cell wall of bacteria. Therefore, it has a low toxicity for eukaryotic cells because it's an inhibitor of uh, peptidoglycan synthesis and eukaryotic cells don't have peptidoglycan. Uh, as I said, again, it targets or inhibits peptidoglycan synthesis, so it works in bacteria, but particularly gram-positive bacteria because they have more peptidoglycan normally in their cell wall, so it weakens their cell wall more than other, um, uh, in more so than in gram-negatives, penicillin. Um, another mechanism of action of antimicrobial drugs is the inhibition of protein synthesis, I remind you that prokaryotic organisms, their ribosomes are 70S, whereas their ribosomes in eukaryotic cells are 80S. They're different. So it has a low toxicity for eukaryotic ribosomes. It may, however, drugs that inhibit 70S ribosome protein synthesis may have some toxicity to the mitochondria in you, the eukaryotic cell. We are eukaryotic organisms, so our cells have uh, the ribosomes in the rough endoplasmic reticulum or in the cytoplasm are uh, not affected by this, but in the mitochondria, the mitochondria do have their own ribosomes and they're different. And you should understand from what we learned before about the endosymbiotic um, uh, evolution of uh, eukaryotic cells, the idea that uh, bacteria and uh, actually it turns out that it probably was some sort of archaea and a bacteria came together in a synergistic, mutually beneficial relationship that became permanent. But you should understand why the ribosomes and the mitochondria for that reason are um, sensitive to inhibitors of 70S ribosome uh, protein synthesis. <clears throat> uh, here you see a diagram uh, or a photomicrograph rather and these are electron micrographs. You don't get pictures of this magnification of bacteria without using an electron microscope. Here you see the untreated bacteria and here you see the bacteria that were treated with uh, penicillin which weaken the bacterial cell wall and cause it to lice and burst and the contents come out and dies. Inhibition of protein synthesis is not just, you know, that one thing. It, there's several different, very, very specific uh, 
mechanisms involved in the 70S ribosome uh, synthesis of protein that can be targeted. So the 70S um, ribosome, ribosomes are made of two subunits. One is 50S and the other is 30S. Together, they form a 70S ribosome. S simply stands, well, it stands for something called uh, Svedberg unit, which is a uh, which is a sedimentation unit. It it's, it measures how uh, something sediments or you know descends through a particular density fluid. I wouldn't ask you about that, but don't add 50 plus 30 and say, hey, you made a mistake. 50S and 30S, the entire complex is in fact 70S. And you know, these different uh, antibiotics you can see inhibit different stages. I, again, I wouldn't ask you which specific ones, you know, that all of this stuff, I wouldn't ask you that kind of stuff, but be aware, you know, that you can have sub uh, mechanisms uh, in protein synthesis, uh, that there are several different things going on and that different antibiotics inhibit, uh, can inhibit different specific uh, parts of those processes. <clears throat> so in terms of inhibitors of cell wall synthesis, there are many, some of which you've heard of. Probably you've heard of penicillin, ampicillin, amoxicillin, you know, um, vancomycin, uh, they act on different uh, target species. We've already talked about penicillin uh, being active against, more active against gram positives. There are different types of penicillin and we'll talk more about that later. These are natural penicillins isolated directly from the penicillin organism. There are also semi-synthetic penicillins. Again, I'll, I'll explain that in more detail later. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you now, but we'll go through it in more detail later. <clears throat> Penicillin can is produced by um, the penicillin uh, organism. It's a fungus. It can be grown large quantity and the penicillin purified from the fungus directly and that would be natu a natural penicillin. Uh, but also it can be uh, purified and then altered so that it is, uh, and, it, and that's why it's called semi-synthetic. So it's chemically changed, you know, they'll change a, a single side group on it and you'll get a different kind of a uh, type of uh, semi-synthetic penicillin and these are more active and penis, natural penicillin is fairly uh, narrow spectrum gra against gram positive, but there are semi-synthetic penicillins uh, that are more broad spectrum. And that's that was the driving force to see if they could find something that uh, an altered form of the natural type that could be have a, a broader spectrum. and. These happen to have a broader spectrum. That's why they're used and you're familiar. You've many people have heard of them or know somebody who took them or have a family member or took them themselves. Ampicillin, moxicillin, not that unusual. Uh, <clears throat> what is unusual about penicillin is it cannot, it cannot be synthesized artificially in the lab. They've tried many different ways to, you know, many people have tried. They cannot synthesize it completely synthetically, uh, which is makes it more difficult. They have to go to the, uh, you know, it's easier in the lab when you can do it, you can scale up the, your process, the chemical process and make these molecules uh, synthetically, but this one you can't. So for these other more advanced types of broad spectrum penicillins, what they had to do was start with natural penicillin and then synthesize, make changes, and make semi-synthetic penicillins from that. Whereas a lot of other uh, antibiotics that they discovered being produced by microorganisms, they purified them, identified them, learned their structure, 
and then uh, worked out ways of synthesizing them in the lab and then scaled it up to an industrial scale and they make it in, them in huge quantities. But with penicillin, it has to first be, you have to start first with a natural product. Okay, let's move on here. These are inhibitors of protein synthesis. The previous page was inhibitors of uh, cell wall synthesis. Uh, again, I don't need you to know which antibiotic does which to, or what, to, you know, what organism exactly. Uh, I'll tell you if I do want you to know a particular thing. Another type of mechanism of action, as I've told you before, is injury to the plasma membrane. Uh, polymyxin B does this. Uh, polymyxin B is only used uh, externally, so you can only use it on your skin. You can't take it into you. Um, now, uh, there are some antibiotics that will target the plasma membrane of uh, fungi. Fungi are more difficult to treat. Many fungal infections are chronic, uh, and they cannot. They're 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 chronic uh, infections that go on for a long time. They progress slowly. They're difficult to treat, and most of the reason they're difficult to treat is because fungi are eukaryotic organisms, just like animal cells, our cells are eukaryotic. We're a eukaryotic organism. So it's more difficult to find something that's very specific that will only affect fungal organisms and not human cells. However, one thing is that we have in our plasma membranes, and I hope you remember this, is that we have cholesterol in the plasma membrane of our cells. Quite a bit of cholesterol in each cell membrane is, quite a bit of the, the lipid is in fact uh, cholesterol, whereas fungi have sterol, which is a different kind of lipid molecule. And these uh, drugs, and again, you know, when I, if I say these drugs, and I did mention polymix in the name of it, but you know, you don't have to, you have to know the idea behind it rather than the name necessarily, unless I get into real detail. But these kind of antifungal drugs, they target uh, the sterol in the plasma membrane of fungi, and therefore they have more of a selective targeted toxicity towards the fungal cells than animal cells or eukaryotic, our cells. There are inhibitors of nucleic acid replication and transcription. They will, of course, target nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. There are some more uh, antimicrobial drugs that inhibit the synthesis of essential metabolites. How? By inhibiting enzyme activity. We have uh, competitive inhibitors, uh, for example, uh, this one happens to uh, compete for the active site in a enzyme involved in a key biosynthetic pathway in bacteria. So those are the kind of things, uh, inhibition of uh, cell wall synthesis. Uh, I've actually forgotten what the second one was, and then inhibition of injury to plasma membranes, inhibitors of nucleic acids, uh, inhibitors of uh, synthesis of essential metabolites, inhibitors of, in other words, of enzymes. Um, let's move on. For each of those, the second one was protein synthesis. For each of those, uh, there are examples that you will hear of. Uh, inhibitor, an inhibitor of cell wall synthesis is penicillin. Um, these are inhibitors of protein synthesis. These are inhibitors of the plasma membrane. Uh, cipro, or that's slang for cip ciprofloxacin. In the hospital, they always just say, typically they say cipro. They call it cipro, because ciprofloxacin is a bit of a tongue twister. So they call it cipro, short for ciprofloxacin. It happens to be an inhibitor of nucleic acid replication and transcription uh, in uh, prokaryotic organisms. Uh, 
commonly uh, commonly prescribed for uh, urinary tract infections or UTIs. Uh, and this happens to be a synthesis uh, inhibitor of synthesis of central metabolites. And I mentioned it earlier, it hit, targets a particular uh, enzyme pathway for folic acid uh, synthesis. Okay, now we'll get into uh, the particular examples. I'm sort of focusing more and more on each of the those five targeted uh, mechanisms. So for inhibition of cell wall synthesis, we talked about uh, we talked about penicillin, and this is exactly what I said earlier. It inhibits peptidoglycan synthesis, therefore it's more effective in gram positives, which have more of peptidoglycan in their cell wall. There are natural penicillins, and then there are semi-synthetic penicillins that have been developed from the natural ones. And are partially synthetic. They've been altered chemically in the lab. In fact, there are more than 50 different chemically related uh, antibiotics, penicillins that are related to the natural penicillin. They all share a common structure at their core. And that common molecular structure that they all have is called the beta-lactam ring. It is a ring structure in the uh, in the chemical uh, composition and structure of the molecule. The different types, the different types of semi-synthetics uh, penicillins have different side chain variant, variant uh, they've made changes on a different group attached to the, to some of the rings. And you'll see that here. So this is, these are two naturally occurring uh, penicillins that can be isolated, purified from penicillium organisms. The beta-lactam ring is this four-sided uh, ring. Quite an unusual kind of thing. Beta-lactam ring found in all of these types of molecules. These, as I said, penicillin G and, and penicillin V are uh, natural antibiotics, and these here are examples of semi-synthetic penicillins where changes have been made to the side groups. So as you can see that this is different from the kind of things you get on these natural ones. It's been altered. And here again, this has been altered. The rest is the same. All the others that have this uh, shaded purple area here, that's all uh, uniform in all of them, and they all share that one key characteristic of having a beta-lactam ring at their core, that four-sided ring, that four-sided ring structure. So there's the what's called the penicillin nucleus, this shaded area, and just like we call the side chain that varies between amino, different amino acids, you know, the 20 different amino acids all have a different R group side chain attached to the alpha carbon. These, this side group here is called R because it differs in all of these in the, in the natural and in the synthetic ones. That's what gets altered, semi-synthetic ones, that's what gets altered. Penicillin, natural penicillin has two major disadvantages, the narrow spectrum. As I said, I've told you before, they uh, it has a fairly narrow spectrum. It's more effective only against gram positives, but now there are broader or extended spectrum penicillins. Uh, in fact, they were developed quite a long time ago that are effective against both gram positives and gram negatives. And that includes these, ampicillin and amoxicillin. The, so that narrow that disadvantage of its narrow spectrum of activity has been overcome. But there is another problem that has also been overcome but continues then to, eventually it still is a problem. And that's the sensitivity of the beta-lactam ring to an enzyme called penicillinase. 
And penicillinase goes by another name. It's too bad I don't have it on this slide, but uh, it has a second, a different name. It means the same thing. Uh, an alternate name is called uh, also beta lactamase. Okay, so penicillinase or beta lactamase is an enzyme that will cleave or cut the beta lactam ring. And in that way, it, in, it inactivates beta lactamase. I'm running out of space. Beta lactamase. Same as penicillinase. It cuts the beta lactam ring, so it inhibits the activity of the antibiotic. Now, <clears throat> when you have uh, this kind of uh, enzymatic activity, oh, I did have it here, also called beta lactamase. Uh, when you have that kind of activity, then it, it then it's resistant. So, for example, MRSA is uh, back uh, is bacteria. It's Staphylococcus. It's methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Okay. You know that Staphylococcus aureus is a fairly common organism. It can cause infections. It's actually everywhere it's on us, but sometimes people get infected with it. And often you can't treat it with uh, penicillin or um, uh, often you can't treat it with penicillin because it uh, it's produces the methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, produces this enzyme and it inhibits the, it'll inhibit the penicillin by uh, cutting that beta-lactam ring. It'll stop, it'll it's inhibit its activity by cutting the, breaking the ring. So what they did was they, that, that pushed people not only to get over the, to try and improve on natural penicillin, to try and uh, uh, improve the narrow spectrum, but they wanted to try and find something that was more resistant to the action of penicillin, uh, not penicillin, penicillinase. So they were looking for something resi for resistance to penicillinase, so they made semi-synthetic penicillins. Methicillin was the first semi-synthetic penicillin that was penicillinase resistant. That's a bit of a mouthful. Don't get your penicillinase mixed up with penicillin. All right? Penicillinase is the enzyme that inhibits penicillin activity by cutting that ring. So they came up with methicillin, the very first semi-synthetic type of penicillin that was penicillinase resistant. Unfortunately now, there are, and for a long time now, there have been these methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus organisms. So that's a, a big problem because then they have to go to other types of antibiotics that are less commonly used um, and less effective. Some, or not less effective, but they are, oh, they are effective, but uh, it's not so easy to use them. For a variety of reasons. So these, this enzyme, it's just one, these are two al alternate names, penicillinase, beta-lactamase. What it does, as I told you, is it cuts uh, the beta-lactam ring and you end up with this, which is inactive. <clears throat> I should point out to you, and you're going to be doing this test in uh, the lab, or I'll talk about it in the lab, um, we'll talk about it uh, certainly in lab seven, but this is a disc diffusion test. What this involves is taking a uh, petri dish with nutrient agar in it and plating bacteria over the entire surface. And at the same time that you plate them all, you put on these little filter papers that are impregnated with different kinds of disinfectants or antibiotics, something that has a, hopefully an antimicrobial action. 
and then you put it in the incubator and you s then wait to see after overnight incubation to see if the presence of that uh, disc infused with a particular a antibiotic and each one of these has a different antibiotic agent uh, impregnated into them you see if it causes what's called a zone of inhibition and you can see here that in this particular case there is no effect it did not inhibit the growth of bacteria whereas these others did and they do each have a zone of inhibition where there's no bacterial growth it's a very effective way of figuring out whether an antibiotic is resistant to a particular um, uh, sorry whether an antibiotic is effective against a particular organism on this plate they've plated staphylococcus aureus uh, and you can do different organisms and put different uh, you know uh, discs on it's a very quick easy way and you get the result overnight so what we have and uh, is we're going to talk more about MRSA this methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus um, which is uh, <coughs> resistant uh, to methicillin. Methicillin is the first semi-synthetic um, antibiotic that uh, could not be uh, affected by penicillinase, but eventually um, the organisms came up that were resistant to it. It's common in the on the skin of the population, and no, Staphylococcus aureus is. It's very commonly present in the skin of people and in their uh, outer nasal cavity. About 30% of the population will carry it. It can and, and have no effect at all, but it can also cause sometimes some serious infections, including um, uh, spreading in the blood, which is blood septicemia, uh, or it can cause a pneumonia. And <clears throat> it's treatable unless of course the type you have is methicillin resistant or some of the ones you have in you are methicillin resistant so people go around carrying it it's not a problem but if they do get an infection with it and if it is a methicillin resistant strain then you have a problem first observed uh, quite a few years ago now the spread of this and again it's it's not a question of spread of the infections or spread of the disease it's just simple spread of the organism because in most people the vast majority of people it will not cause an infection but you'll carry it in on your skin or in your outer nasal passage you get it from uh, contact with secretions from lesions or nasal discharge spread by the hands somebody wipes their nose with their hand with their forefinger and then opens the door and boom it's on you know some of that nasal discharge is on the door handle and then you innocently come along and open the same door and you get it on your hand and then you wipe your nose and bingo you got it and then you carry on and it's part of your natural uh, bacterial uh, normal microflora that you carry but uh, maybe you're going to come maybe you'll be one of the unfortunate few that come down with uh, in, that it causes an infection in you and it's not treatable with methicillin now MRSA organisms are a real common problem in hospitals long-term care facilities it can be treated with vancomycin, although uh, that has its own inherent problems sometimes. Cephalosporins are antibiotics, a group of antibiotics that are uh, effective against gram negative organisms. And there are, you know, con they're constantly developing new types of uh, cephalosporins. So they're called second, third, and even fourth generation types of cephalosporins. Uh, 
they share the characteristic beta-lactam ring that the uh, penicillins and semi-synthetic penicillins also have in that penicillin nucleus. They have that same beta-lactam ring. These uh, used to, uh, <coughs> these, um, I'm sorry, just a second. It says uh, these used to be penicillin resistant, but uh, uh, sorry, these used to be penicillinase resistant. Uh, and that's not a good wording. Let's block that out. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to confuse you with that. So let's knock that out. There have recently occurred some bacteria that can produce a beta lactam uh, beta lactamase or penicillinase that is able to inactivate uh, cephalosporin. So, um, cephalosporin was used because it it didn't it wasn't affected by penicillinase or beta lactamase, but now there are some bacteria that can produce a type of beta lactamase that is able to inhibit uh, inactivate this this antibiotic. So it is becoming a problem for the use of cephalosporins. There are some uh, antibiotics that are uh, uh, protein in nature. They're polypeptides, and that includes bacitration, another type of topical only uh, um, antibiotic. I already mentioned another type of topical only antibiotic. It was called uh, polymyxin B. And if you go into the pharmacy and look at the antibiotic creams or ointments that they sell over the counter, then you'll find that uh, polymyxin B is and bacitracin are both found in those. They're used, they're sold over the counter as uh, antibiotic cream. Sometimes it's called triple therapy. I'll mention later what the other antibiotic used in there is. But polymyxin B or bacitracin are topical only. Bacitracin happens to be effective against gram positives. Uh, vancomycin, which is used when you have a methicillin resistant organism, is also a protein polypeptide uh, uh, molecule. It is a last line of defense against uh, MRSA organisms, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. However, unfortunately now there are vancomycin resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus organisms appearing. So they first they try methicillin and it doesn't work. They realize they're dealing with an MRSA organism. Then they try vancomycin, which always was considered, oh, this is our last line of defense. It'll help, it'll work. And now, unfortunately, there are also some strains out there that are vancomycin resistant. There are also VRE organisms, not only uh, vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, but vancomycin resistant Enterococcus. Enterococcus, from the name, you can understand, hopefully, that it's a coccus, or round kind of organism, which is which grows in the intestinal tract, so it's enteric, uh, and therefore is called enterococcus. Species means that there are several, SPP here, SPP means multiple species. So we're talking about this genus, Enterococcus, and several species in that genus. There are several species of Enterococcus that are vancomycin resistant. And this came up before the VR, uh, vancomycin resistant MRSA actually. 
So vancomycin resistant enterococcus are VREs, which are a real problem in hospitals. Uh, first isolated in the 80s, they can cause uh, a number of problems and are not uh, responsive to vancomycin. The presence of vancomycin resistant bacterial species within a, inside a hospital is considered an emergency problem. They will move the patients out, they will try to clean the entire area, they'll uh, close an area, that wing of the hospital or that floor of a hospital if there are vancomycin resistant bacteria present in there and then they'll clean it out as best they can to try and remove everything and then they'll go around testing sampling the environment sampling surfaces sampling you know areas to see if there's any more uh, bacteria present before they'll allow people back in <clears throat> now mycobacterium organisms and there are two big ones particularly the one that causes tuberculosis but there's also the one that causes leprosy so mycobacterium tuberculosis which causes the disease tuberculosis is a problem certainly uh, the kind of antibiotics that are used are specifically targeted towards them so they're called anti-mycobacterial uh, antibiotics and the common one that's commonly used is isoniazid There are some that uh, some antibiotics inhibit protein synthesis. Examples of that are chloramphenicol. A problem with chloramphenicol is that it could suppress marrow stem cell replication. So too much is not more more is not necessarily better because it could be toxic to the bone marrow some antibiotics and the example i'd like you oh here neomycin that's topical so we have three topical uh and topical means by the way it can only be used on the skin okay so we've discussed now three different topical antibiotics uh, polymyxin B, bacitracin, and neomycin. If you go in the pharmacy and you look at the kind of uh, antibiotic ointment that they sell over the counter, it's it, you don't need a prescription. It, and sometimes it's called triple therapy ointment. It'll contain those three, polymyxin B, neomycin, and bacitracin. So these are inhibitors this one is uh, happens to be an inhibitor of protein synthesis i don't need you to know that but what i would like you to realize is that uh, the antibiotic gentamicin which a lot of people have heard about uh, these are nice broad spectrum antibiotics but one problem with gentamicin and it's a serious problem and i happen to know someone who uh, unf well is fortunate to be alive because she had uh, meningitis bacterial meningitis she was treated with uh, high doses of gentamicin and unfortunately is now stone deaf because the auditory nerve for reasons I, I'm not I don't know or haven't looked up actually the auditory nerve can be damaged by gentamicin and so that that's a problem you can get toxicity and damage to the auditory nerve and it's that sensory nerve that um, brings sensory information from the from the inner ear into the brain and it can be uh, damaged by gentamicin so injury to the auditory nerve can occur with gentamicin injury to uh, bone marrow stem cells can occur with chloramphenicol Tetracycline, I already told you, is broad spectrum, effective against both gram-negative and gram-positive. The nice thing about it is that it penetrates into tissues. It gets into cells. So it's also good for intracellular organisms like rickettsia and chlamydia. However, you can get superinfections in the gastrointestinal tract because, you know, if you 
with a broad spectrum antibiotic, if you take it orally, then you're taking it into your GI tract. The point is to absorb it into your tissues and to that it should, um, you know, it's used for people with infections. You have an infection in your uh, some part of your body tissues and they give you tetracycline, which is fine and it gets absorbed and it is nice also because it'll penetrate in case you have a chlamydia infection, uh, intracellular infection. But the problem is that it'll kill off the gram negative and gram positive organisms in your GI tract. And therefore it opens people up to um, the problem of super infection, which I already discussed with you, because it kills off all those other organisms, the bacterial gram negative, gram positive organisms, it can lead to an overgrowth, a super infection with a fungus called a yeast actually, which is a single celled fungus called Candida albicans. And many of you are familiar with this idea of yeast infections. And when they talk yeast infections, typically they're calling, they're talking about Candida. And so they're talking about Candidiasis. Candid, that's the, that's a infection, Candidiasis, infection with Candida associated with an inflammatory process also. And this uh, overgrowth of candida can be really quite bad. You can get, uh, you know, the whole lining of the gut is yellow colored because the organism in huge numbers are yellow. And, uh, all, and, 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 and the entire reason, we all have candida on us all the time. It's all around us in, in the environment. But normally it's kept in check by other organisms, normal part of the normal microbiota or microflora that is growing in our inner on our inner surfaces or outer surfaces, it's kept in check by that, so it doesn't overgrow. But once you kill it off with a broad spectrum, all these other bacteria, when you kill them off with a broad spectrum antibiotic, then hey, there's lots of opportunity for Candida to overgrow and for person and that develops into, can develop into uh, candidiasis, super infection or overgrowth. Good. I think we're reaching the end in terms of uh, uh, those different mechanisms, those five different mechanisms of action of antibacterial uh, antibiotics. There are inhibitors of protein synthesis. Uh, quite a good one is called mupirocin. It's um, effective against gram positives, including MRSA. It's topical, but it's not over the counter. It used to be, but it's not anymore. Um, it's quite effective against um, um, impetigo and little kids, they get it around their mouth and you, it, it will work quite well against mupirocin. Uh, it will, mupirocin will work quite well if, against, uh, and it, a lot of uh, impetigo is caused by um, uh, staph, staphylococcus pyogenes. But I think maybe staphylococcus stories can also cause impetigo. Polymyxin B, as I said, is topical. I, again, I, you know, I don't need you to know that it particularly injures plasma membranes, but I think it's good to know that the topical over-the-counter ones, uh, topical meaning only used the skin on the outside are polymyxin B, bacitracin, and neomycin. So this one happens to be able to injure plasma membranes. These have a different type of activity, but when you mix the three together, they can be quite effective. Although I tried it on my son because he had an impetigo infection around his mouth and it was useless, but then mupirocin was really good. Uh, there are some drugs that inhibit nucleic acid synthesis. Uh, Cipro, I already told you about 
very effective against urinary tract infections. I mentioned that some inhibit uh, essential metabolite synthesis, and they do that by acting as uh, competitive inhibitors. You know that a competitive inhibitor will, let's change colors, they act as competitive, this acts as a competitive inhibitor. You know that a competitive inhibitor binds into the active site, therefore blocking, there's the active site in this enzyme. Normally that would interact with the substrate, but the competitive inhibitor can fit in there and therefore block the entry of the substrate and therefore inhibit the action of the enzyme. <clears throat> I'm not gonna get into this, it's simply showing a blockage in the... Okay, I think that's more than enough for the... Uh... Oh, we only have four more slides, so we'll... I'm gonna finish this off. Now, I have talked a little bit about antibiotic resistance. I talked about methicillin resistance, uh, methicillin being a semi-synthetic uh, penicillin that could not be cleaved by penicillinase uh, and therefore was used, but then Staphylococcus aureus, some Staphylococcus aureus have developed uh, a resistance to treatment with methicillin, methicillin uh, uh, antibiotic and the reason is because they can cleave uh, methicillin. Now the idea of antibiotic resistance is important and very relevant and something to be aware of. Uh, the resistance is coded for typically by a gene product. If a bacteria has the gene that allows for uh, some sort of mechanism of antibody resistance, then if it acquires that gene, then it will be antibiotic resistant. Uh, and mutations can certainly uh, result in alteration of a gene that helps it become antibiotic resistance. There are actually several different types of antibiotic resistance that can be found in bacteria. Um, sometimes it's uh, the ability to express and produce a particular enzyme that can destroy the drug. Uh, for example, the ability to produce beta-lactamase or penicillinase. Uh, sometimes it's the ability to prevent entry of the drug into the uh, host cell, uh, into the cell itself, so it becomes resistant to the effect of the, of the drug. Sometimes there's a change, you know, the drug's target site, each of these drugs has, each of these antibiotics has a particular site that it targets, that it affects. Sometimes that's altered due to the, due to the uh, a gene that they acquired, giving the bacteria antibiotics. And sometimes they're able to actually pump out the drug. These pumps, and it's not really that, well, to put it simply, it's, it's not so much different from the idea of the sodium potassium pump, except which is a protein in the surface of the membrane of cells. In this case, this protein pump can pump out drugs so efficiently that the, if, if that's expressed, if that protein is expressed, if the gene coding for the protein is, gets into a bacteria, if the bacteria acquires it and can express it, then it'll be able to pump the antibiotics out so quickly that it's resistant to the antibiotics. So <clears throat> acquiring an enzyme that can destroy an antibiotic, uh, acquiring the ability to uh, prevent penetration of the antibiotic, uh, changing the target site of the antibiotic so it's no longer sensitive to the antibiotic, or being able to pump out the, the antibiotic really quickly. These genes that code for these, uh, for pro, after all genes code for proteins, the gene that's, genes that code for these proteins that are, enable this kind of uh, resistance are often found on plasmids. I'm not gonna get into this uh, discussion of that. I told you about plasmids, they're small circular pieces of double-stranded DNA 
that are self-replicating. They're little round rings of DNA that are self-replicating in bacteria. The bacteria can multiply and as they multiply the plasmids also are multiplied and carry on in the next generation and they'll have genes on them in certain locations. Oh, there could be a gene here or a gene here. It's double-stranded. Uh, gene here, I'm trying to show this on different sides. Genes can appear on one particular side of the DNA or the other. So they can have several genes in them and if the gene codes for anything allowing these then uh, you can get resistance and plasmids and this is extremely important to understand plasmids can get transferred between bacteria bacteria can transfer plasmids over to another bacteria and it doesn't always have to be the same species of bacteria so you can imagine, let's say, if you did have a plasmid that coded for antibiotic resistance, an antibiotic resistant gene, if you had a plasmid and it's inside a bacteria which is perfectly harmless and is growing in you, so you have a lot of them. Here's the bacteria around the plasmid, right? You have a whole bunch of them. And you happen to get infected with a pathogen and the harmless bacteria transfers the plasmid into the pathogen. Then you have a pathogenic organism which carries a gene coding for antibiotic resistance. And so it can cause um, disease and will not be able to be treated with that particular antibiotic. One of the problems of modern life is that uh, we don't we come up with these miraculous uh, tools because of our research and investigation and understanding that we develop for how things work. So we work out, you know, that there are antibiotics that they can be made, that can be used, but then we abuse it. And one of the major reasons why uh, antibiotic resistance uh, is increasing in incidence, and there are more and more bugs out there in our environment, with, meaning among different people carrying it, and sometimes animals carrying them, there are more and more bacteria that carry genes for resistance to antibiotics, is because we actually do things that help select for bacteria that are resistant, subpopulations of the bacteria that are resistant. And one of the big things is the misuse of antibiotics. Antibiotics are wonderful, but if you use them in the wrong way, then you will tend to increase the incidence of resistant bugs bacterial bacteria that are resistant to the uh, action of that antibiotic. And the kind of misuse I'm talking about is using outdated or weakened antibiotics. Because if you have a population, you, you, you should realize that if you have a population of many, 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 many bacteria, okay, you got billions and billions of bacteria, right? And let's say it's a um, you have an infection, and you know you you had some antibiotic around that it was you know from another time a year or two ago when you had an infection, and it was really seemed like the same kind of thing. So you have some left over, and you know instead of going to the doctor and trying to get an appointment, you decide okay well. I'm going to take a few of those and see if it works. And it does. You take them and it seems to work. And the reason it works is because it kills off most of the, almost every single one, in fact, of the others. But it leaves, it kills off all of these. But it doesn't kill off uh, just a small number. A small number of them are not killed. 
The reason is that it's outdated and it's been weakened and you're taking it, you have it for whatever reason you have, you have it, you take it, but it's, 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 it's um, outdated. So it's decayed in its effectiveness and it'll kill off most of the bugs, but a few will be able to survive because they do have resistance. And those few that do survive, and I've left them here, two right there on the side, they will start to grow. Okay, you stop taking, you feel better, it seems to be getting better, but then these grow. And these are the ones that had resistance. And now when you get treated with the antibiotic, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because these are resistant ones. So that's one way, using outdated, weakened antibiotic. Sometimes people, you know, it's a question of selection. Sometimes people use antibiotics at the wrong time for the wrong thing. They'll use antibiotics for a cold. Cold, the common cold is caused by a virus. It cannot be affected by antibiotics which act against bacteria. But sometimes people take antibiotics for the common cold or they even get prescribed an antibiotic for a cold. And what happens is you're, you've got a lot of the antibiotic in you and if there are a few bacteria in you that are resistant, they're the ones that are gonna start growing. And they'll be more common. Sometimes they're, you know, they're not usually, uh, uh, it's not usually a bacteria that causes a problem, but if it does, it's antibiotic resistant. Or you have a whole bunch of them, they're not pathogens, but there's a lot of bugs in you, non-pathogenic organisms in you with the antibiotic resistant gene and they pass it across, it's in on a plasmid and they transfer it over to a pathogen. That's a problem. So misuse by using it in uh, using antibiotics the, uh, for something that's not necessary. And a good example of unnecessary use of antibiotics is uh, antibiotics that's added to uh, animal, particularly beef uh, food. Uh, adding antibiotics to beef cow feed causes them to be able to put on meat protein muscle faster. I won't get into why, but it does. And and so you have all these animals that are constantly getting antibiotic. It will select, it'll kill off the sensitive ones, but it'll allow the resistant ones to become more common. And then sometimes those get into humans. They spread to the human. Spread of a bacteria from, or any microorganism from an animal to a human is not uncommon. Or sometimes people, and it's sort of like the, this example here with the weakened, uh, using weakened old antibiotics. But sometimes people, they feel, they've taken the antibiotic and they feel better, so they stop. They don't take the full course. And again, what's happening is that they're killing off most of the bacteria, but if they had continued, they would have killed those extra few that are more resistant, but they didn't, they didn't do that. And so those, are still there and then those multiply. What they should have done is kept taking the, back, the antibiotic because it's not an all or none thing. Resistance is typically not all or none. It's like, yes, it's sensitive or no, it's resistant. It's a graded kind of thing. And you can have some, a few that would have been killed if you had used either, you know, up here in this example, uh, non-outdated full strength antibiotics and sometimes they'll survive because you didn't take it for long enough they'll get they would have gotten killed off if you would taken the complete course then their resistance wouldn't be strong enough to survive for that long a period in the presence of the antibiotic and then there's the uh, or maybe the stupidest abuse is using someone else's leftover prescription. They tell you, oh, you tell them you're sick. You tell them what they you have. They go, oh, I had that. 
I still have some antibiotics left. I'll give them to you. And so you use someone else's leftover prescription and you end up with the same kind of, you know, stupid, uh, inadequate killing of the bacteria, leaving the resistant ones there and those can grow. And when bacteria grow, they grow fast. They really do. They can double every 20 minutes in you. And you just sit down and try and, you know, in 24 hours, if bacteria are doubling every 20 minutes, that's the fastest they could go. But even if it's a little slower, it's still a huge number. If you start even with a tiny number like two and you figure out what happens in 24 hours of doublings, so the there would be, um, if it's every 20 minutes, it's three per hour, it's roughly 72 or 71 doublings. Two multiplied together 71 times is a incredibly gigantic number. It's well past trillions, okay? Now, the last thing I want to talk about here is uh, synergism. Sometimes combinations of drugs are very effective. Sometimes they're the opposite. Sometimes they inhibit each other. If they inhibit each other, that's called antagonism. So an antagonistic effect is that two drugs together have less of an activity of I than either one alone because they inhibit each other's activity. So that's an antagonistic kind of effect. But some drugs have a synergistic effect. The effect of the two drugs together is greater than either one alone, or sometimes even a better description would be greater than uh, the sum of each individually. And you can see the effect here these are examples of, again, this disk diffusion test where we have an organism growing all over the surface here, all here, you can see it all over here, growing all over the surface because it was plated all over the surface. And at the time it was plated, these disks were put on and the disks have different uh, antibiotics inside them. And the antibiotic diffuses out into the agar, nutrient agar. And you, you know, you put, you plate bacteria over the surface, you put the discs on, you put it in the incubator, the bacteria grow, but where you have antibiotic that is effective, it doesn't grow. But in some areas, what you see is that the effect of the two together is stronger. And so you get these areas of larger zones of inhibition. You can even hear you have a zone of inhibition that's occurring here because this drug, which normally at that distance is ineffective, and this drug here, which normally at that distant, distance away is ineffective, and the further they go, the less concentrated they are, but the two together are quite effective. You see, so that's a nice example of uh, synergism. I hope you understand that. Perhaps you might have some questions about it. Perhaps you might have a lot of questions about this uh, <clears throat> lecture. There's quite a bit of information. Anyhow, that's the end of uh, lecture 12 on antimicrobial drugs and the effect of antimicrobial drugs.